Well, thank you all for being with us and uh, welcoming our third panelist uh, today. I want to briefly introduce myself. My name is Isabel Zog, and I'm a postdoctoral research scholar helping to lead the Global Language Justice Sawyer Seminar that uh, Professor Liu uh, introduced earlier. Uh, and my area of research uh, looks at the Amharic language and the Ethiopic script uh, use in Ethiopia and Eritrea. And today we have uh, four distinguished guests with us who I'll briefly introduce. I want to give them plenty of time to share their work with you. Uh, first, uh, Aeli Keskedalo is from Godegenau in Finnmark. She is president of the Sami Parliament in Norway for the term 2017 through 2021. Geskedalo has represented Sami Association of Norway at the Sami Parliament since 1997. She was elected the first female president in 2005. Geskedalo has a master's degree in public administration from Copenhagen Business School. She's the mother of three daughters and she emphasized that language policy is both an important part of her political work as well as the work that she does at home. Our second guest is Ganeladans Tara Skitters. She's a Mohawk woman from Akwasasne, a Mohawk speaker and mother of five. She's been part of the Akwasasne Freedom School for most of her life. Uh, first as a student, later as a parent, then a teacher, and currently as the office manager. In the fight for sovereignty, the citizens of the Mohawk Nation recognized that self-determination was critical in education, and the Akwasasne Freedom School was created as a place for holy Mohawk education. Grounding learning and teaching in Mohawk lifeways, the school has survived political, financial, and institutional challenges to become a respected and supported institution of the Mohawk community. And through the ongoing efforts of parents, families, and the larger Mohawk Nation community, it has played a critical role in the formation of Mohawk identity, citizenship, and nationhood for the past 25 years. Our third guest is Angel Vicente Ferrer. He is a doctor in Linguistica Indoamericana by the Centro de Investigaciones y Estudios Superiores en Antropología Social Unidad CDMX. He is a native speaker of Nahuatl language of Tepeteno, Tlatla, Quetepec, Puebla, in Mexico. Currently, he is at the Department of Latin American and Iberian Cultures at Columbia University as a Nahuatl professor. Also, he is collaborating with the New York Court and the Consulate of Mexico in New York as interpreter and translator. His research topics of interest are spatial deixis in Nahuatl, morphophonological variation and multilingualism in higher education. At present, he is working with doctors with Dr. Uh, Re, Regina Martinez Casas in a paper about the bilingualism of Mexican students of secondary education. The most recent article of Angel is Traspasando los Limites del Entorno de Deícticos Espaciales Medios Amarcadores Discursivos, El Caso del Nahuatl de Tepeteno, Tlatlaquetepec, Puebla. And our fourth guest is Romina Quezada Morales. She's a scholar and professional member of the Permanent Seminar on Linguistic His Historiography at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and one of the minor coordinators of UNAM's project, Aproximación a la Literatura en Lenguas Indígenas, Indígenas Mexicanas. She specializes in language and education policies, studying the role of educational issues related to languages in international settings and in relationships between countries. Her research draws on theories from linguistics, international relations, and education. She obtained her BA in English teaching from UNAM and her MA in inter international politics from Jilin University in the People's Republic of China. 
In 2015, she was admitted to one of the German Research Foundation's research training groups at the University of Duisburg-Essen and was a visiting scholar at Columbia University's Institute of Latin American Studies in 2016-2017. A polyglot, her work, uh, she has worked and collaborated with different cultural, educational, and diplomatic institutions such as the Kamui Institute of Portugal, the Embassy of France in Mexico, and the UN. And her current and future projects involve US-Mexico initiatives in education for Mexican indigenous peoples, the implementation of UN education-related policies for Mexican indigenous, oh, excuse me, and the promotion of Mexican indigenous languages. So we welcome you. We welcome you, you all, much. and uh, you, uh, you are our first speaker. Ologeito, Haliadan Aligit, Dainat Dervahan, Dan Alamoga, Man Etnami, Alde Medaliat, Lenamba Alamoga, Dervahan Ya Utne, Yakasi. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I started by uh, uh, acknowledging. Uh, the Lenape people, the Lenape nation, uh, which is the people of these lands, in my own language, Northern Sami. Uh, I would uh, like to start with uh, saying that it is such a privilege and a pleasure to be invited uh, to speak at this symposium. Uh, the topic selected by the organizers are both innovative and appealing, and I have had such an inspiring day uh, so far. Uh, I really would like to comment uh, on every topic and, uh, and share with you some Seasami experiences, but um, uh, I will try to keep uh, within uh, uh, the selected theme of education. Uh, but uh, probably I should start with uh, telling you a little bit about the people uh, that I represent. We need to switch out the microphone. Sure. Is this better? Oh. <laughs> should I do it over again? or um, It's fine. Thank you. Well, the Sami people is an Arctic indigenous people, and we live in uh, what is now uh, the nation states of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and the Kola Peninsula part of Northwest Russia. So we live across the borders of uh, four different nation states, and uh, I will comment a little bit uh, more about that later on what kind of challenges that, uh, that means uh, to us when it comes to language policies and, and education. Uh, I uh, am uh, the president of the Sami parliament in Norway. Uh, and the Sami parliament is a democratically elected parliament. Uh, and it was uh, created under principles of democracy and self-determination for the Sami people. And the parliament was founded in 1989. And Norway was the first of uh, these four countries, Finland, Sweden and Russia, to set up a Sami parliament. So today we have Sami parliaments also on the Finnish side of the border, uh, the Swedish side of the border. Uh, but not uh, on the Russian side of the border. Uh, but we cooperate, the three Sami parliaments and Russian Sami organizations. Uh, the Sami parliament's objective is to strengthen the political position of the Sami people and to promote Sami interests and needs in Norway. Uh, we try to facilitate equal and fair treatment of the Sami people. And as a part of that, we strive to path, pave the way for the Sami to protect and develop our languages, our culture, our, and our community life. Uh, 
the Sami parliament basically works with matters and issues that the Sami parliament itself finds relevant. Uh, so our authority is largely defined by legislation, budgetary transfers, and our own involvement in various matters. Uh, and one example of that is uh, the specification of curricula of teaching plans. Uh, we uh, have the responsibility for the produ production of uh, Sami teaching materials. Uh, so we administrative and rank priorities when it comes to production of uh, uh, teaching material materials in the Sami language. But uh, we have no influence whatsoever on the allocation the Norwegian state makes for the production of teaching materials. So we do not control the funding, uh, but uh, within the funds all, all allocated, we are, uh, we are expected to, to make some um, priorities. And uh, I have to say that there is still a distressing lack of teaching materials in the Sami language in Norway. Uh, beca because of uh, the lack of adequate uh, uh, state funding. Uh, Norway is one of uh, the states, uh, the UN member states, that has uh, ratified the ILO Convention 169 on Indigenous and Tribal Peoples in Independent Countries. And they did it as early as 1990. And... Uh, uh, as a part of the follow-up on the ILO Convention, uh, the Sami Parliament and the Norwegian government signed an agreement of consultations back in 2005, uh, which is a tool uh, to, to promote, uh, uh, to promote uh, uh, our, our possibility to, to, uh, uh, to uh, self-determination. Uh, this agreement of consultations uh, requires us, us to engage in dialogue and to cooperate with the state uh, uh, in decisions that uh, will have consequences for the Sami people. Uh, but uh, it is kind of lacking this uh, agreement on consultations among other because it's um, it's not uh, uh, connected to, to the funding uh, of the Sami parliament. So it's not uh, all economical issues are not a part of uh, the consultation agreement. Uh, we are currently working uh, with uh, the government of Norway on um, uh, making this uh, agreement of consultations uh, statutory. And uh, I'm pleased to say that this might happen uh, uh, possibly within uh, this year so that the agreement of consultation will become a law of consultation between the Sami and the Norwegian government. Uh, I would like to say something about the Sami language situation. Uh, we have... Uh, several different Sami languages. So the Lami, Sami language area is not uniform and in, it includes several, several different languages. Altogether 10 Sami languages. Uh, and while some might choose to regard these as dialects, the differences between them are actually great enough to qualify them as languages in their own right. For instance, in my own case, uh, I speak North Sami, and I would not be able to communicate in my own language with a person speaking South Sami or Kildin Sami. And seven of these uh, uh, Sami languages have uh, their own written language. Enari Sami, North, North Sami, Kildin Sami, Lule Sami, South Sami, 
umesami and skoltsami. And all these languages uh, are consider, considered threatened languages by UNESCO standards, and some of them severely threatened. Uh, there is only one of the Sami languages uh, that has more than a thousand speakers. Only North Sami has more than a thousand speakers. Uh, and what is really uh, complicating uh, our language issues, issues is that the areas in which these different languages are used do not follow the national borders. For example, Lula and South Sami are spoken, is spoken in both Norway and Sweden, while North Sami is spoken in Norway, Sweden and Finland. Uh, so uh, the national borders, they are really messing up our possibility to, to, uh, to strengthen uh, our languages. Uh, another complicating matter is that there, there is no exact register of the number of Sami-speaking people. In fact, there is no exact register of Sami people. Nobody ever counted us. Uh, so, uh, to create policy when you have such a lack of, uh, of, uh, of numbers, is, uh, is also uh, kind of challenging. Uh, but there are estimates. And uh, based on um, a survey on the use of Sami language made in 2012, there is an estimate on uh, uh, about 25,000 Sami speakers in, within Norway. Uh, and uh, within Norway, there is uh, three of the Sami languages that have an official status, North Lule and South Sami. Uh, we, of course, try to co coordinate us with the other Sami parliament in cross-border language cooperation, trying to ensure that our languages do not develop differently so that I, as a North Sami speaker, can communicate to other North Sami speakers on the Finnish side or in the, on the Swedish side in the future. Because we are so few, it would be horrifying if our languages develop so differently that we cannot use them anymore together to communicate in the future. And also, this is also a, a case of efficiency. When we are so few language users, it makes sense to cooperate when it comes to teaching materials. Uh, but when we, live, when we live in different nation states uh, and have different uh, curriculums, teaching plans, it is also a challenge to make the same teaching materials. Another, language, another example on how state borders are complicating and somewhat confusing. Uh, the Sami parliament, we allocate funding to uh, 14 different language centers uh, in Sami areas uh, in Norway. And these are uh, like grassroots language centers, uh, providing uh, uh, co language courses and pro providing arenas to use the language. And we also allocate funding to uh, uh, bilingual programs in uh, 11 municipalities and four county, uh, county municipalities in, in Norway. Uh, our point of departure is that Norwegian and Sami are equal languages. And this has been decided by law in Norway in the Act of the Sami Parliament.
Norway's constitution also establishes that the Sami are entitled to use our own language uh, and to develop it and to develop uh, our culture and community life. Uh, there is uh, stat statutory rights to daycare and school in Norway uh, for Sami children. Uh, and uh, so uh, Sami children have the right to be met in their own language and with their own value platform in daycare and in school. And they have the right to linguistic and cultural development throughout their school years. Uh, and these rights are well enough embedded in uh, Norwegian legislation. Uh, but uh, there is a big gap of implementation of these uh, language rights. And uh, uh, that gap uh, is sometimes because uh, uh, the parents do not realize what kind of rights their children have. And sometimes bef because uh, uh, the municipalities do not uh, effectively uh, organize the, the, the education or that they, they cannot get uh, uh, qualified teachers. Many pra practical problems. Uh, so I totally agree with the speaker earlier today that said that uh, uh, teachers and, and education of teacher is, uh, teachers is essential uh, for, uh, for uh, developing uh, and safe, uh, safeguarding of indigenous languages. Uh, and it's also so that many Sami children lack language area, arenas where they can practice their language outside of school or outside of the preschools. Uh, we would like to, to uh, strengthen uh, the legal framework for, for education in, in Sami. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we, we need to follow up on how these rights are implemented, how they are realized, uh, so that our children uh, get the rights that uh, they have on paper. Uh, I would just uh, like to uh, say something about um, in connecting with uh, with the international uh, language year for indigenous languages. Uh, this uh, uh, will uh, this coincides with work we are doing in the Sami Parliament to. Uh, to follow up on a great language reform. Uh, and I hope uh, that we, uh, as a parliament, can contribute to both, uh, both uh, spreading the word, uh, word about the indigenous um, language here, back home in the Sami areas and in the Arctic, but also that we can provide uh, uh, indigenous communities in other parts of the world with some examples uh, on, on uh, how to work with, uh, with uh, language policy and, um, and um, uh, language uh, cooperation, uh, especially the cross-border cooperation that we have. We think that uh, we have some examples that can be interesting to other indigenous peoples and also to the states that the indigenous peoples live in. Uh, uh, our language reform will be initiated next year. Uh, and uh, because of that, we, we are eager to take part in the planning and follow up, up on the in, international year. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, I will be able to take part in that as I'm nominated to the steering committee uh, for representing the Arctic region. 
uh, we will be happy to share our experiences and ideas with other indigenous peoples in the hope that indigenous languages will have a future even in an area in which majority languages dominate. Thank you for your, uh, your attention. Olugito. Sego, the Guanajuadas, Garalatas, Yungets, Aquasasta, Niduagategio, Ganyat Gahaga, Niwaga Honjoda, Aquasasta, Londa de Wanio, Gian de Wiestaqua, Ginua Wagiote. Hello, the Guanajuadas. Um, my name is Ganalatas Skitters. I'm from Aquasasta. I am of the Mohawk Nation, and I work at the Aquasasta Freedom School. Um, I just want to stand because I'm more comfortable standing. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about the Aquasasna Freedom School, um, about the from the beginning to the present, and how we how we plan to continue in the future. So from the beginning, I just want to say that the Aquasasna Freedom School began out of a conflict with New York State over land. New York State had wanted to come in and take more land from our reservation for um, development or something. I don't know. Anyway, there was a group of people that band together and said no, and they were going to have, they had a standoff for a while, a couple years, actually. They didn't let the state in. But during that time, during this encampment, there was, um, there was these leaders, and they were traditional leaders, they were speakers, and every day they were sending their kids to school, and so the New York State buses coming in and picking up their kids, and they're sending them to school, and then they, they started thinking, what are we doing? Like, we're here in a standoff against the state, but yet we're sending our kids to this to the state to be educated by the state to become Americans or Canadians because our reservation is located on the border, which is another issue I won't get into. But um, So they decided they were going to start a school, and they didn't have a plan, and they didn't have funding, and they didn't have a building. They didn't have anything, but they said, we're going to keep our kids here, and we're going to educate them as to what it means to be a uh, Ganyakahaga person, a Mohawk person, a person who is part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy as a whole, and teach them about our history and our culture and our language. So in the beginning, um, this school, and I know a lot about this, like as she said in my introduction, I was, I've was i been part of the school for most of my life. My parents were part of the group that was in this big group of parents that decided to start the school. And in the beginning, the school was not taught in the language. It was taught in English. Um, because, you know, they were just doing what they had to do. There was, there was planning, but it was all in talk. And, you know, I can't even say there's anything written down in stone exactly. But um, I've heard a lot about this from my mom and my dad and a lot of other parents that were involved in the beginning. Um, so at the time, my mom was one of the teachers, and she was teaching about colonialism to these older students the older group, and I think at the time there was only two groups. There was younger kids and older kids. And so she was teaching a class about colonialism, and in the back of the room, one of the elders came in, and he was a speaker, and he was um, someone she respected a lot. And he's sitting there, and she said she was so nervous because she was like, oh, my God, what's he going to say? And so when she finished her class, he waited till all the all the students left, and then he said, he told her that he wanted to talk to her, and he said, you know, he said, when you teach these students, you need to teach them out of love. You need to teach them about who they are and to love who they are. He said, because if you teach them to hate what other people did to our people, they'll just carry that hate. So... She said, he said, teach them how to love our people, and they'll carry that love wherever they go in the world. So she always, um, she remembered that, and she always taught that way after that point. And she really, you know, my mom didn't have the language, that's why she was teaching in English, but she, it taught her how to teach her own kids, how to teach me, and I have <laughs> seven siblings, eight, eight, so there's a lot of us. So she had a lot of love and made a lot of kids. 
<laughs> her and my dad. So um, <laughs> I'm the second oldest, so there's a lot of lessons in that. Um, so anyway, she really, she told me that, she didn't tell me this until just a few years ago. And um, the elder who told her that, he's passed away. But he was really known around the world. He was a very well-known our, um, elder. His name was Jake Swamp. Um, but anyway, so the, those principles are kind of things that those parents got together and decided that they were going to, that's what they were going to base this school on. And so in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, we have these three pin- principles of peace, which are skana, gasat, stasala, and gatni gunlio. Skana means peace. Gasat, stasala means strength. Gatni gunlio means a good mind. So everything that was ever established for this school was was established on those three principles. And, you know, in that time, that was 39 years ago, and this school is still going, and sometimes I don't know how they did it. Like, <laughs> in the beginning, I was a, I was young, but, you know, I saw my mom and all these other parents come together, and, um, like, teachers didn't have salaries, we didn't have a building, it was all volunteers, it's all grassroots. Um, our parents would come to the school every week and do bingos or do... Um, pizza sales or they built a, they built a bakery and they started making bread just so they could sell bread so they could pay the teachers and a lot of the teachers didn't get have a salary for the first I don't know maybe 10 years they just did it out of they just volunteered and these teachers weren't necessarily teachers they weren't they didn't have degrees they didn't have diplomas they just were fluent Mohawk speakers who wanted to teach so those teachers really had to be creative, and they taught just like they would teach their own children. They did a lot of hands-on activities. They did a lot of cultural activities. Um, if they didn't know something about um, a ceremony or something, they had these elders who were part of this encampment come in and teach the students and speak about what they knew. So it was a really big... Um, community initiative to get the school going and over the years you know we've had we've found other ways to get funding and we've had groups from Columbia University and groups from Germany and people from Ithaca and all over all over the states in Canada that have come to our school and have come and said how did you do this and we're like we don't know no (laughs) we just did it we just did it one day and kept kept going and kept working at it and, you know, people are really attracted to the school and what, what we do. And I think a lot of that has to do with those values that were first laid down 39 years ago. And they're still there. So at this time, you know, we've been going this long. We're on a, probably our second generation. Like, my kids go. I went to school there. My, my children go to school there. Um, I have one that went from freedom school, went from pre-K right up to grade 8. Then she went to high school, and now she's in college. Um, and I also have one in pre-K right now. So I have a big range of children. <laughs> um, but in that time, so we've developed all these different ways of teaching, creative ways of teaching, but it's all comes from our Ohanda Galiwa Dekwa, which is our um, Thanksgiving address where you give thanks. We give thanks to the natural world every day, the people, the plants, the water, the fish, uh, much like the greeting this morning um, that we heard. And so we take that and we've created our curriculum from that. And so it's a thematic curriculum. And what we've done is it's not broken down necessarily into um, math, science, but you take that theme if it's people and they would teach like biology or teach, you know, different things from that theme, different aspects of science and math. Um, and... But at present time, that's that's how we've been doing it. And at, right now, we have um, 14 teachers, and 10 of them are our our alumnus. They're students who went through the Freedom School. They went to high school. Some of them went to college, and then they come back and they just want to teach, and they want to um, be at the Freedom School, and they want their kids to be there because of what they got out of it and how much they learned. And those students that I find leave our school are really grounded in who they are as Haudenosaunee people and as Mohawk people. They know who they are. They know 
where their people came from. They know how to do their ceremonies. They know their language. They know their songs. They know dances. They know why we have ceremonies. They know when the ceremony should happen. They know stories. Um, you know, they are traditional people, and it's kind of their, it's like it's a lifestyle. It's not just a school. You know, so that's kind of how the school was established, and it's how we've we've maintained all these years and those values. Um, and so, you know, going into the future, the one thing we've been learning about for the past few years and partnering with is um, we've been learning about Waldorf education. And Waldorf education is very similar to what they follow nature. Um, it's a lot of based on child development. Um, they do a lot of hands-on activities. There's not a big push for um, reading and writing until they're a little older, and that's always how we've done it. So we found that that type of education suits what we've already, what we've been doing all these years, and that we're, that's where in the future we are looking towards. Um, we already have a few teachers, myself, and three others who've taken a course in uh, anthroposophy, which is a study at the foundations of Waldorf education. And we're learning more and more about that as a whole for the staff, but we don't have funding for everybody to do it at the same time. So we're slowly, different ones are taking the course. And um, we don't want to be a Waldorf school, but we want to enhance what we've already established all these years. We think the Waldorf education really fits into what we do and will just make it better and make it more whole. So if there's areas like we're not perfect, you know, there's areas that we need to work on. And I feel like Waldorf education really fits into those areas and helps with the structure and different things and, and, and um, also helps with the teacher training because all of our teachers come from different walks of life and some of them have college education and some of them only have high school. Some of them are first language speakers. Some of them are second language speakers. So with Waldorf education, it kind of will give us a little more structure to our teaching techniques and our curriculum. Um, so that's one thing we've been looking into and we've been learning a lot for about the past two years now. Um, and I just wanted to say, I don't know if I'm out of time. <laughs> um. Okay. Um, so I just want to say thank you for asking me to be here. Um, still a little new to me, but um, <laughs> everything was really interesting today so far. Um, oh, there was something else. Where, so currently also, I meant, I meant to mention this, is that we are working on building a new school. At, the, at present time, we have three buildings. So we have, we have 74 students from pre-K to level nine. Um, and we also have a language nest, which is for our, our babies. They're like one and a half to before they start school because, um, as we heard earlier, that first those first five years are really important. So in our language nest, we call it a language nest. Other people call it a daycare, but it's an immersion. <laughs> it's an immersion language nest. Um, so these babies are constantly, it's kind of just like a home. They're there, they eat, they sleep, they play, they fight, just like four-year-olds, three-year-olds. But they're constantly in the language. They play games, they sing. But because we are where we are at and because we've grown, we have um, the language nest in one building. We have our older students in level six to nine in another building, and we have pre-K to level five in another building. So we are currently fundraising for a brand-new building, um, which would house everybody so that we would all be back under one roof. And that way our oldest students um, can socialize with our language nest a little more and their a little more cohesiveness with the teachers. Um, and we'll just see each other more instead of like in the wintertime where, you know, we're up north, so it's kind of cold, so we don't rush to the language. If they need to, if the language nest um, babies come to a social or come to something at the school, they got to bundle up 10 two-year-olds, you know, or three, four-year-olds. So it gets a little difficult. Um, so anyway, we are fundraising for a new school, and Douglas Cardinal is the architect who's working on the school with us. And, um, you know, we still got, that's, that's got a lot of work to do in the next few years, but that's our plan is to move back 
And, and the land we're on is actually located near a, used to be a GM plant. So there's a lot of pollution in that area. And where we want to build this school is, is seven or eight miles down the road and further from all of that and a little further from everything, a little more, a um, little quieter, further down. And we could have more things like gardens and things like that. It's a bigger area, bigger space. Um, so with that, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening and thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Professor Liu, for this invitation. And uh, thank you, Professor uh, Elsa, for this invitation, too. Uh, I will speak about the multilingualism in the United States, in different universities. And first, I, I speak you in my own language. Is Nahuatl. As you know, Mexico has uh, 68 indigenous, indigenous language, and the Nahuatl is the most important. So, this is Nahuatl. It's like a sitting one, so a sitting. Nignekiskia, ma naonechkawiliskia, naonechtlapowi, y canomasewatlahtoi. Niman. Nina mechon tlapoguas, ica inglés, oso ica español. Que manin tlatlaca, tlatoua, ipa no mas ewatlachtol, no so ica, no mas eroal iniguan. Nejuan ipaki, guaneme lak senka, ni mopakilisquia, in tlatejuan hueli, titlapoguasquia, ica to mas ewatotlachtol. Isquinon, ne, nina mechon tlasos, camatilia. Pampa naneshkawilia, mani ne machlapogua, pani tomase watlastowan, wanin tlamashlisli. Nikin yeyehkowa, mahnihin kuali tonal, pampa tehuan kuali, tikasikimati, panen y mexico, mase watlastowan. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to allow it to speak with my indigenous language. Then I will speak to you in English or in Spanish. When people talk about my indigenous language or about my indigenous brothers, I feel happy. But I really feel happy when we can speak with our indigenous language anywhere. For this reason, I thank you. Because you allow me to, to talk about the relationship between Mexican indigenous language and higher education. I think that it is a great opportunity to reflect on the indigenous language of Mexico. At this presentation, I will, argue, I will argue in favor of the following. The linguistic diversity is a social phenomenon present in many cities. Language are essential cultural components. Therefore, its conservation is important. Considering that its scientific, artistic, and cultural vocation, the university is one of the best spaces for the discussion of linguistic diversity, as well for reflection on minority language. Now, I would like to speak in Spanish because I can speak um, better than in English. So, uh, maybe uh, we need, we will need a translator. Uh, La diversidad racial y lingüística es una condición importante del panorama sociocultural actual de Estados Unidos. Ello ha motivado que en algunas universidades se empiece a reflexionar en torno a dicho fenómeno. Considerando su vocación, perdón, por ejemplo, en, 2018, en 2008 se formó 
el proyecto de etnicidad y raza en Latinoamérica, que en México se conoció como Perla, en la Universidad de Princeton. Y ahí tenemos el enlace para consultar ese proyecto. Este proyecto tiene como propósito fundamental colectar y analizar datos que permitan explorar distintos fenómenos raciales en Brasil, Colombia, México y Perú. Otro ejemplo que llamó mi atención se publicó recientemente en el New York Times y en dicho periódico el periodista John eh, Hank halló que en Lassell College, que está en Massachusetts, Newton, está tratando de preservar la diversidad lingüística y racial dentro del aula. Finalmente, Columbia University, el Lehman College y el Lenguayu unieron esfuerzos para crear el proyecto sobre lenguajes dispersos en la ciudad de Nueva York y a través de ese proyecto se llevó a cabo la enseñanza, aprendizaje y el estudio de cuatro lenguas minoritarias en América Latina. El creyol haitiano, el mixteco, del que se hablaba en una mesa anterior, el náhuatl y justamente el quechua. Esto pues nos permite reflexionar en torno a lo que estamos haciendo ahora. Para esta presentación voy a partir de dos ideas básicas y que son complementarias. La primera, que las lenguas pierden y ganan poder. Son más o menos visibles y algunas toman el espacio de otras. Y este proceso ha sido histórico. Pero la idea que nos da esperanza es que así como las lenguas pierden poder, también las lenguas pueden ser revitalizadas, pueden ser resignificadas y pueden recuperar espacios de uso. Esta última posibilidad que nos plantea Martínez Casas es la que nos permite hablar de la dinámica que presentan las lenguas en las grandes ciudades, que entre otras características son espacios multilingües y pluriculturales. Y esto nos lleva a plantear o a preguntarnos qué significa ser o qué significa el multilingüismo, qué significa ser multilingüe y cuáles son las políticas en torno a ello. Una de las cosas más importantes que hemos aprendido los que somos lingüistas y los que hablamos lenguas minoritarias, es esta proposición de Wang que dice que la política lingüística en el ámbito educativo es un fenómeno altamente complejo, involucra múltiples intereses y conflictos y la superdiversidad en el lenguaje, en el salón o dentro del aula, es una tendencia que no puede evitarse. Los diferentes estudios que se han hecho, así como los diferentes proyectos, en ocasiones nos muestran una visión del multilingüismo poco esperanzadora, porque generalmente se plantea el multilingüismo como un problema que se tiene que resolver, sobre todo en las grandes ciudades. También se plantea que el multilingüismo es un fenómeno social, lingüístico y político que requiere de financiación, y que también requiere de la unión de muchos esfuerzos, que no siempre se logra. Y algo muy importante nos ha enseñado este fenómeno, que la supervivencia de las lenguas minoritarias muchas veces se encuentra condicionada por la voluntad de los propios hablantes. Si los hablantes no desean hacer eso, entonces es imposible casi cumplir con ese proyecto. A esta visión se le opone otra diferente. 
en la cual se nos plantea la posibilidad de no ver el multilingüismo como un problema, sino como una oportunidad para el diálogo, sobre todo intercultural e interlingüístico. Una posibilidad también es tratar de comprender que entender varias lenguas o ser eficiente en varias lenguas tiene un impacto positivo en la sociedad. Finalmente, una posición benévola del multilingüismo nos permite comprender que el multilingüismo puede promover el diálogo civilizado más que el monolingüismo. El, el multilingüismo es un fenómeno que debido a la globalización debería ser considerado la regla y no la excepción. Hasta hace poco se pensaba que ser multilingüe era una especie de ser raro. Lo que ahora hemos comprendido es que no es así. Ser multilingüe quizás es lo más normal que pudiéramos encontrar, sobre todo en las grandes comunidades. Y tal vez sería lo más deseable. Algunos conflictos internacionales incluso podrían resolverse si se pusiera mayor atención al multilingüismo. La gente que es monolingüe en muchas ocasiones encuentra que las puertas se le cierran, precisamente porque la comunicación finalmente abre puertas. Y para terminar esta breve introducción, me gustaría recordar lo que decía Nelson Mandela en algunos de sus discursos y que nos permite comprender la importancia del multilingüismo. Él dijo lo siguiente, si tú le hablas a una persona en una lengua que él entiende, eso va a su cerebro o va a su cabeza literalmente. verdad. Si tú hablas o le hablas a él, en su propio lenguaje le hablas a su corazón y eso es muy importante cuando nosotros hablamos con las personas tratamos de comprender eso uh, recientemente eh, tuvimos una invitación de la Corte Suprema de Estados Unidos para asistir a dos mexicanos que estaban en un proceso y del cual no voy a hablar mucho por la misma situación, pero sí me gustaría compartir esta anécdota. Y es que a estas dos personas no se les había permitido un asistente hasta ahora, o no se había encontrado un asistente náhuatl, español, inglés. Y cuando nosotros llegamos a asistir a estas dos personas, pudimos ver inmediatamente que tenían una mirada de esperanza, porque finalmente estar en esas situaciones es muy difícil. Eh, en esas situaciones nosotros comprendemos por qué es importante el multilingüismo en, en, en una ciudad como Estados Unidos o en, como Nueva York ¿qué entendemos por multilingüismo? multilingüismo lo entendemos como el uso de una lengua o la competencia de un individuo una persona o también se le da el nombre de multilingüismo a la situación lingüística de una nación o de una sociedad entera. Lo cierto es que definir multilingüismo no es sencillo. Hay otra definición de multilingüe que es más complicada aún. Kemp nos dice lo siguiente, un multilingüe es una persona que tiene la habilidad de usar tres o más lenguas, ya sea separadamente o en varios grados de mezcla de códigos. Las distintas lenguas son usadas con distintos propósitos. La competencia en cada una varía de acuerdo a factores como el registro, la ocupación y la educación. Y esto es muy importante cuando nosotros le preguntamos a los demás si habla inglés o español y él nos responde que sí, con toda la empatía y con toda la voluntad. Y después empezamos a conversar con él nos damos cuenta que él tiene solamente algunos registros, pero que otros no. 
Y esto es muy importante comprenderlo porque los que nos dedicamos a dar clase, los que enseñamos, a, nos es muy fácil entablar comunicación con los estudiantes cuando comprendemos que pueden tener diferentes niveles de competencia lingüística en diferentes lenguas. A pesar de lo que he dicho anteriormente, definir multilingüismo es muy complicado. Por una razón sencilla, es muy difícil que se entiende por lengua, sobre todo cuando estamos en el ámbito de la oralidad. Para tomar en cuenta una lengua, los investigadores, los lingüistas, necesitan tomar el grado de eficiencia de los hablantes y eso no siempre es sencillo. Como lingüista y como profesor, uh, y como hablante también de, de náhuatl predominantemente, de inglés en segundo lugar y ahora de inglés, normalmente cuando yo hablo en diferentes situaciones me estoy monitoreando siempre y eso es algo que no puede dejar de hacerse. Y entonces uno se pregunta realmente hasta dónde sabe uno o no la lengua en cuestión. Esto es muy importante para la educación, sobre todo cuando tratamos de delinear criterios pedagógicos. Otra razón importante por la cual es difícil definir qué es un multilingüismo tiene que ver con los factores políticos, sociales e identitarios. Normalmente cuando nosotros deseamos pertenecer a una comunidad de habla distinta a la nuestra, pocas veces comprendemos que detrás del código lingüístico se encuentran factores políticos, sociales e identitarios. Posiblemente quienes recién llegamos de México a Estados Unidos, ah, hemos sentido el impacto del, del discurso que predomina hoy sobre México en general y sobre los mexicanos en particular. Uh, y en ocasiones a veces nos preguntamos si estar en Estados Unidos es bien, es bueno. Uh, eso no se puede evitar. En México durante mucho tiempo se ha enseñado inglés como lengua secundaria y como lengua casi obligatoria desde la educación secundaria. Y hasta ahora no logramos comprender muy bien por qué no se logra éxito, mucho éxito en el aprendizaje de la lengua. Nuestras investigaciones recientes, por ejemplo, nos permiten comprender que algunas personas tienen sentimientos encontrados cuando están aprendiendo inglés. A algunos les interesa aprender inglés porque lo ven como lengua de éxito, pero otras personas no sienten esa misma, no tienen ese mismo sentimiento, sobre todo en los últimos días uh, que estamos viviendo y con las diferencias políticas que hay entre los gobiernos de los dos países en cuestión. ¿Qué entendemos por multilingüismo y cuál es su relación con la educación superior en Estados Unidos? Cuando yo inicié la elaboración de esta presentación, me di cuenta de algo interesante. Las investigaciones en torno al multilingüismo y a la educación superior en Estados Unidos son recientes y hay poca investigación que en realidad se está haciendo en este sentido, pero sobre todo investigación empírica, es decir, investigaciones dentro del aula. Tal vez esta uh, poca cantidad de investigaciones tiene que ver con la política lingüística que hay en Estados Unidos y es que nos hemos dado cuenta que no hay una política realmente clara, una política lingüística realmente clara en el país. Hasta ahora lo que nosotros hemos podido investigar es que las instituciones dejan como cierta libertad para, para cuestiones lingüísticas. Algunos investigadores 
dicen que incluso en la constitución del país no existe algo escrito que determine cuál es la lengua oficial de este país, sino que se deja un poco a la deriva. Y eso también ha impactado en la esfera de la educación. Pues realmente no, no se sabe a ciencia cierta cuál es la postura de muchas universidades o muchos colegios al respecto. A pesar de ello, hay dos tendencias fundamentales que están surgiendo y que se han seguido al menos desde la década de los ochentas. La primera se resume en la sentencia de formar buenos americanos. Y la otra tiene que ver con tolerar la diversidad lingüística y cultural. Pero solamente bajo la propia organización de las propias comunidades. De tal manera que nosotros podemos ver que hasta cierto punto las instituciones se hacen un poco al lado de lo que está pasando lingüísticamente en el país. Hasta ahora nosotros, o en mi caso, yo no puedo tomar una posición respecto a una u otra perspectiva, porque son muy complejas y de hecho no solamente estas dos perspectivas están en Estados Unidos, se encuentra también en México. Históricamente México es un país que también tuvo esas dos perspectivas durante mucho tiempo. Durante la época de la colonia, por ejemplo, se trataba de castellanizar a la población indígena lo más que se pudiera. Y eso duró hasta los 90 aproximadamente, un poquito antes quizá, pero es en los 90 cuando se empiezan a crear instituciones en México que empiezan a abogar por las comunidades indígenas. Entre esas instituciones está el Instituto de Lenguas Indígenas, el Instituto Nacional de Lenguas Indígenas, la Comisión para el Desarrollo de los Pueblos Indígenas y otras. Pero antes de ello también veíamos esta postura o esta perspectiva. En el caso de la educación, eso es muy importante, porque de alguna manera o de otra, las instituciones educativas van a pegarse a un modelo o a otro. Por cuestiones de tiempo, no voy a referirme a una propuesta que surgió en California y que solamente planteaba la enseñanza del inglés como lengua meta. Pero sabemos que existió y que recientemente ha empezado a cambiar para darle paso a esta a libertad de lingüística y libertad de culturas. Las dos perspectivas tienen bases sólidas para, el, para su defensa. La perspectiva que defiende el monolingüismo dentro del aula en inglés, se sustenta en algunas investigaciones que nos dicen que los inmigrantes empiezan a perder su lengua nativa a partir de la tercera generación. Otras investigaciones también nos dicen que demográficamente los inmigrantes son las personas que más están adquiriendo inglés como lengua de aprendizaje. Y la última nos dice que el inglés es la lengua alta y es la lengua que se usa en los espacios públicos. En contraste, las otras lenguas son lenguas que se usan en el espacio privado. Finalmente, hay una última posición respecto al monolingüismo y es que el inglés asegura el éxito académico. En cambio, las otras lenguas no siempre, al menos dentro de de Estados Unidos. La perspectiva que aboga por el multilingüismo nos dice que el modelo monolingüe en cualquier lengua en muchas ocasiones 
tiende a utilizar estrategias de castigo. Y investigando encontré este pequeño fragmento discursivo que se registra en una escuela de Estados Unidos y que nos muestra algunas estrategias de aprendizaje. Y entonces rápidamente voy a traducirla y con esto voy a terminar. El discurso dice así, en este salón, o este es un salón solamente de inglés, o solamente en el cual se habla inglés, si tú hablas español o cantonés, tú deberás pagarme 25 centavos y yo seré inmensamente rico, me volveré rico. Ah, este discurso es muy importante eh, porque en México durante mucho tiempo se tuvo un discurso semejante. Entonces, a los niños indígenas se les prohibía hablar sus lenguas y se les castigaba. Y entonces, durante mucho tiempo las lenguas estuvieron en riesgo por eso. Para no eh, tomar más tiempo, voy a pasar a las consideraciones finales acerca de lo que he hablado aquí y entonces diré lo siguiente. Debido a su posición política, económica, sociocultural, Estados Unidos es un país multicultural y multilingüe. No obstante, actualmente no observamos la presencia de una política lingüística clara que nos permita guiar la vida de las lenguas presentes en este país, que para algunos investigadores en Estados Unidos se están hablando aproximadamente 380 lenguas. Como en otros países, por ejemplo en México, este panorama ha motivado el surgimiento de dos perspectivas, una que se basa en el monolingüismo, principalmente en inglés, y otra que acepta el multilingüismo. Como las dos perspectivas tienen argumentos sólidos, por ahora no podemos definir o podemos decidirnos cuál es la que debería emplearse en el aula. Y sin embargo, lo que sí nosotros estamos sugiriendo es que haya una mayor discusión en las universidades de Estados Unidos respecto a esta situación, de tal manera que pueda haber una colaboración entre investigadores de diferentes disciplinas. Es necesaria la colaboración de lingüistas, de pedagogos, de estudiosos de los derechos humanos, pero sobre todo lo que estamos sugiriendo es que hace falta una participación impresionante de los propios hablantes de esas lenguas minoritarias, pues finalmente son ellos los que deberían decidir hasta cierto punto qué hacer con sus lenguas. Sin embargo, esto no nos deja para decir que las propias instituciones, ya sea educativas, ya sea gubernamentales, también tienen que participar en estos debates, porque al debatir este problema o esta situación, nosotros debemos remontarnos a un concepto fundamental y que parece estar resurgiendo en estos últimos días, el concepto de nación. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, before getting started, I would like to thank Columbia University as well as the partner institutions for the invitation and the opportunity to speak of an initiative that started last year as a joint effort in Mexico to spread literature in the country's indigenous languages. As will be shown, yeah, it is already there. Excuse me, thank you. So as will be shown, this is an example of how universities are capable of promoting equity when it comes to indigenous languages. 
Um, this last presentation is part of the Indigenous Languages in Education panel, and its symbolism as such denotes exactly the ultimate expression of languages, which is literature. In that light, I would like to introduce Aproximación a la Literatura en Lenguas Indígenas Mexicanas, which in English would translate into an approximation to literature in Mexican indigenous languages. So here is an overview of the project. That's uh, the title. And so conceived in uh, 2007 at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, also known at UNAM in the Acatlan branch, the goal of this pro uh, project is uh, to promote contemporary literature written in Mexican indigenous languages. Um, this initiative is also carried out by scholars from several Mexican institutions, as we will see. And among the envisioned products are the organization of colloquia, a blog for the diffusion of works, and the publication of a printed literary volume. Through those means, the initiative hopes to show that Mexican literature in indigenous languages can have the same linguistic and cultural quality as what is produced in Spanish. But of course, there remain challenges to be overcome, and we will see that later on. So what is literature in indigenous languages nowadays? In 2015, the literature magazine Letras Libres published an article written by Yasnaya Elena Aguilar Gil. Aguilar Gil defined contemporary literature in indigenous languages in the Mexican context. Her definition can be summarized by three points. Number one, it is not pre-Hispanic literature. Pre-Hispanic refers to the time before any contact with newcomers from Spain took place. Most of it was transmitted orally and was put into paper later on. Literature in indigenous languages in the Mexican context is fact post-Hispanic. Number two, it is not indigenous literature. While there are some genres that were developed by Mexican indigenous peoples and are still part of their cultural expressions, the concept of literature refers to the traditional forms of the European world brought by the Spanish and adopted in Mexico. Prose, poetry, drama are literature, according to the definition of literature uh, in indigenous languages. If we spoke of indigenous literature, we would be leaving out novels, poems, or theater pieces written in those languages. And number three, it is a result of intercultural exchange in Mexico. Aguilar Gil talks about appropriation of Western literature to create literature in indigenous languages. But rather than appropriation, it is a result of the linguistic policies that the Spanish enforced 500 years ago and what they considered should be aesthetically correct as a linguistic form of expression. However, instead of wiping away indigenous languages, indigenous authors took the canons brought by the Spanish and used them to write, but in their own languages. So it is not only the genre, but the writing system, as well as linguistic elements deriving from Latin in common, in common to Romance languages. A book in a Mexican indigenous language comes uh, to light from the intertwining of Spanish literary traditions and indigenous world visions. Although to a far lesser degree, Mexican literature in Spanish and the Spanish language in Mexico itself have also been influenced by characteristics from some indigenous languages, mainly from Nahuatl. In other words, Mexican indigenous literature has the same level of complexity and quality as Mexican literature in Spanish. An approximation to literature in Mexican indigenous languages looks to spread and support the works of contemporary writers who typically use their indigenous languages to create literature. The project aims at producing three outcomes. Number one, colloquia. 
Colloquia take place within an academic framework. Participants include specialists and authors. The first colloquium of the project was held on February 28th and March 1st this year. So, uh, not even, yeah, two, yeah not, not even two months ago. So, it included talks by writers who have managed to create a considerably good reputation domestically, such as um, Irma Pineda, which uh, somebody was mentioning in the previous panel already, in Zapotec language, Natalia Hernandez in Nahuatl language, and Jorge Cocompech in Maya language. Uh, yes, Miriam was, was mentioning it. Um, so here you have a flyer. It, this, this was a flyer for the first colloquium. I know you cannot see very well, but uh, basically, uh, or at all, but basically on the left side, you have uh, what uh, all the events and roundtables that were held uh, throughout the first day. And for the second day, everything is on the, on the right side. So as you can see, there were many, many roundtables with different experts and writers. Number two, electronic resources. The main port of access and widespread of the project is its blog called Aproximación a la Literatura en Lenguas Indígenas Mexicanas, La Flor y el Canto Contemporáneo. The blog contemplates to feature information about its creators, about authors, the works, according to different genre and subgenre, such as tales and essays, and related articles and studies. It also aims at displaying music because, as we know, the oral tradition is still Latin. Although it is still at its initial stage, the creator's writer's section already displays biographies, interviews, and pieces of work of some writers, including the young ones. The works are shown bilingually in the indigenous language, which is the original language in, in which they were written, but also in Spanish as a translation for spreading the, the works. And also a more modest Facebook page diffuses the information of events. And here you have what is the cover of the blog as well as the profile picture on Facebook. And number three, finally, published resources. At a, future st at a future stage, the project aims at collecting the most outstanding works of writers and creating a printed volume with them. The outlines for submission of works are to be defined around these dates, and the volume will be edited by UNAM, the Acatlan branch, and the University of Guanajuato. Okay, so although the initiative arose at UNAM's Acatlan branch, other institutions are involved and are great contributors to the functioning of activities. So here you have a list of the basic uh, contributing institutions. The National Autonomous University of Mexico, the Acatlan branch, but also the main campus and the National School of Higher Studies at Morelia, Michoacán and also the University of Guanajuato, the Leon branch is a, a big, big contributor. And finally, uh, although it is not a, a higher education institution, the National Institute of Indigenous Languages, uh, or in Spanish, uh, El Instituto Nacional de Lenguas Indígenas, or INALI, which is a governmental institution, participate uh, in all the points that we have mentioned before. So the role of higher education institutions as promoters of indigenous languages stands out and indicates that those institutions are essential to this task. Although it is an excellent starting point, there is still much to do in order to revitalize indigenous languages in Mexico. Some challenges are the, pub the publications are usually bilingual in order to share the content with the national audience, but indigenous languages should have the same status as the literature produced in the language of state, which in this case is Spanish. In other words, previous policies still undermine the interest towards Mexican indigenous languages among Mexican society, and the literary works produced in them are still disdained by many. There is a lot to be done when it comes to indigenous language teaching in Mexico, as my colleague was saying, and by consequence to taking a closer approach to the literature that is produced in those languages. 
Number two, intercultural is a two-way street. Whereas literature in Mexican indigenous languages has adopted shapes and features from Spanish language and literature, contemporary Mexican authors can also greatly benefit from the linguistic richness of the country in their works. Some do, but there is a gold mine to be exploited. And the same goes for language. Number three, literature in Mexican indigenous languages should be a clear part of the Mexican literature syllabus in schools. Indeed, some professors include literature in indigenous languages as part of their courses at the college level, but works could be studied from the earliest stages in school. Then there is not enough linguistic diversity in the literature produced currently. It is not only about promoting works, but about encouraging creation and diversity. Pieces are found in Nahuatl, Maya, or Zapotec, but very few in some other of the 68 living languages of Mexico, so much of which are very, very much endangered. The intercultural aspect of the country should reach every corner of its territory so that its languages do not get lost. Likewise, increasing the linguistic offer of indigenous languages in schools can also help create awareness of Mexican linguistic diversity and encourage literary production. And finally, this maybe is not related directly to indigenous languages, but is very, very important. The barrier of English to reach out to foreign audiences is still an issue. It has been hard enough for projects like this one to spread literature in Mexican indigenous languages within the Mexican territory. Most of authors are bilingual. They speak Spanish and their indigenous language. And experts are sometimes bilingual, sometimes only Spanish speakers. But there are rare cases of experts speaking fluent English and who are able to introduce literature in indigenous languages to foreign scholars as well as to speakers of other languages. And this could also be an exciting field for translators. So in conclusion, an approximation to literature in Mexican indigenous languages is a multi-university project that has the dual commitment of encouraging and of spreading literature written in one of the many languages of its country that are not Spanish. It empowers authors by inviting them to submit their works and presents existing literary jewels to Spanish language readers. It considers thus that indigenous languages have the same literary quality as Spanish. Although there is a long road ahead, this effort is a milestone in the revitalization of Mexico's linguistic affluence and shows once again that academic institutions play a huge role in the process. So here I leave you with some uh, of the references that I used for this presentation. Uh, the second and third ones are related to this project directly. And special thanks to the members of the project as well. And thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank our guests for their uh, wonderful presentations on uh, indigenous languages and education. Mm -hmm. Professor Liu, do we have time for one round of questions or should we, we move should straight into the plenary? I, I think we should have at least one round. One round of questions. Yes. Okay, wonderful. It's about to talk to the oh, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, yes. Thank you all for your fascinating presentations. There's so much food for thought. I have a specific question. Thank you. Professor Ferrer, you mentioned during your presentation that you found uh, that some people experienced a mental block um, toward learning English. Could you just expound on that for a minute? Because I found it fascinating. Professor uh, Vicente Ferrer, can we hold 
Can you hold your thought while we finish our round, and then we'll start with you. Okay, second question. Yes. Hi, uh, this question could be for anyone, but especially for Professor Vicente Ferrer. Y, 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 y que, oh, this is especially for Professor Vicente Ferrer y Quesada Morales. Um, I'm wondering if maybe you can talk about uh, the challenges of um, if it, your work can relate to what's happening in the United States where we have a growing population of Mexican immigrants who speak indigenous languages. Um, but particularly um, when it seems like the dominant sort of uh, civil rights conversation nationally around language is about preserving and promoting Spanish. So um, it, to the detriment of indigenous languages, because of course the US government is not, is not funding all of these languages at the same time. So if you can talk about perhaps a, a bit more about how uh, your work uh, may respond to that and, and uh, how we might look at that in the United States. Okay, thank you. Hello, hi. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, the fact that... Um, I just wanted to point out uh, the fact that I really think because of my daily interaction with a lot of these poets and writers that are identified as indigenous Mexican, um, I guess, creators, that this is a very, very special moment for that in, in Mexico. And that in the same way that in the, in the 1990s, there was a renaissance of Native American um, literature here in the US with, uh, for example, people like Sherman Alexi, Joy Harjo, Linda Hogan, Leslie Marmosilco, and Scott Mamaday. I feel we can make a connection to what's happening in Mexico right now, of course, with the different you know, languages involved. But I think it's really important that the kind of work that you're conducting will keep on being, um, I guess, happening and supported. I, I am also a good friend of Yasnaya. I couldn't put the slide of her photo today. <laughs> But I am very good friends with Jasnaya and with also um, different people in Guatemala, Gladys Sul Sul. So we are, the three of us and other people are doing what we can. And about Jorge Cocompech, his poem on eh, Tu idioma es la casa de tu alma, I personally think that should be one of the most important poems included for the 2019 year of uh, indigenous languages. Because it's one of the most beautiful poems that have been written, and I think if it could be translated in different languages. We have it in Ashanika right now, which is the, a language in the Amazonian. Uh, it was also done in the group, and in uh, we're trying it for Quechua now. So I just wanted to let you know, I am also very fond of Jorge Cocompech, and I really thank you for your contribution. Thank you. If I say, Antadik Nechi Senle, Ochatla de Ki, Wena, Lenapi, Wena, Nechi Sachi, Wekahani, Wena, Nefagale, no we. Uh, just want to recognize, of course, the Lenapi uh, traditional caretakers of this this land. Uh, I was uh, had the uh, uh, responsibility and uh, uh, challenge of uh, sitting with um, the last Lenape speaker in the state of Oklahoma. There are Lenape speakers in. Uh, up in Canada, and I think maybe even in Wisconsin, but um, uh, the last uh, uh, elder we had, Leonard Thompson, uh, passed away during the first decade of the world's indigenous uh, peoples. Um, but I wanted to ask a question. Um, I, I really appreciate this attempt to be more inclusive and to have uh, multiple languages in education and in literature, but I, I guess I'm... I'm wondering about whether it's enough to just say, okay, we'll start all over and now everyone can play on the board at the same time, when in fact, um, some of us have been excluded from, the, from playing the game for many generations. And there's a great deal of shame. There's a great deal of, um, you know, I don't know, uh, challenge of self-esteem even um, in our community. Unfortunately, I've taken a habit a bad habit, I should say, of making jokes about English language. Um, 
precisely because, I mean, the, the, the politics of it is that uh, our communities and our language speakers uh, have been put down for speaking their language or for perhaps not having good enough English or English with an accent for so long that even, even to this day, when we see our elders, our Yuchi elders, uh, in the little grocery stores in Oklahoma, you know, and I, we ask them, you know, uh, we get near one gene at town. What are what are you trying to buy, or just something to greet them? And you know, they look around. You know, where is that teacher that may be coming to punish them? So they don't want to speak their language. Their first language speakers. We have so few of them now, but they're embarrassed to do it. So I'm asking the question. Sorry to ramble so long, but I'm trying to ask the question. Uh, you know, do we need to? Uh, is it helpful somehow to to make fun of, say, uh, colonial languages, English language? I say English language is not really a language. It's kind of the trash heap of of European colonial, you know, pre-colonial history that has kind of resulted in this. Uh, I, I, it's not really a living language. And um, we were, I was telling uh, our our group at the uh, Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues with the Indigenous Languages Caucus, who we had our side event, that we were planning a great funeral for the English language. And we were going to get a, a coffin <laughs> and carry it around the UN, and we would put the, the enormous uh, Oxford English Dictionary inside the coffin. <laughs> because it is a language without soul. It is a language without depth. It is not based in a living community for whom that language really lives. It's just a, a cipher, a symbol for other things. So I'm asking this question, am I really out of line for making fun of English after all these many generations? <laughs> okay, thank you. I think we have one question here and then a speaker question. I'm not sure how many more we can do. I promise this gentleman. And then thank you. Uh, take, take her. Okay. Thank you everyone for your great presentations and sharing your in insights. Uh, I have just two quick short questions. One is the parents' motivation is to have their children do well in school. So uh, do the children or the students get credit for studying indigenous language? Or what are the challenges you see? Or can they take assessments in, the, in indigenous languages? The second point is that the language policies uh, determine um, national language policies determines what are the language of instructions available in school. In fact, um, most of the the death or um, of indigenous languages accelerated when national states started implementing the national language policies. We can come here in this symposium like this. Uh, we can share our thoughts, we can um, um, help each other share our knowledge, that helps. But uh, the question is, if we keep saying that it is our problem, I think we are still falling behind uh, because the policymakers, okay, let them talk about their issues, but they may not implement anything. So how we can move from language issues is our problem to the policymakers' problem. Okay? Meaning that as long as we keep screaming here is our problem, they may not be solved. But how do you make it their problem? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, in the back. <laughs> it's okay. Um, just, I'm reminded of two things, and this is really for all the panel, just to, to, uh, to I'm looking at a continuum, and it's about poetry. On arriving to New York, I received an email from the Endangered Languages Alliance around, um, with some footage of, 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 uh, um, for you, on YouTube, on communities, endangered language speech communities, writing poetry around their thoughts of being in New York in their respective languages. And an anthology will come out of that. And I was very inspired by that. And then I thought also, how, how is that hap 
how, how could we gather something like that in New Zealand? And then I thought, my daughter wrote her PhD on, on um, poetry that's uh, a collection of um, indigenous song and uh, as political commentaries of our past. And so we have those. They are considered, you know, our poetry. We have amazing collections that our ancestors put together and have been published. And we continue to compose in, in that context as well, to create new poetry. But it's just never put into that context. So for all four of you, your song and your dance, your rituals, and I remember um, the children singing. Um, in all of our ethnicities and our cultural groups, our language, speech communities, we must all have song and dance. Am I correct? And all of you, do you consider that poetry and do you document this? Do you encourage new work, new poetry by our children our old people as well, and our children, to create the new language, I guess, and ideas around the present. I know it's a loaded question, but I thought it was a really nice way because we all have song and dance. Thank you. Hi. So just uh, two quick questions. Um, one on literature as a category. Uh, I guess, uh, how, how do you feel about the, the Pulitzer being awarded to Kendrick Lamar, a rapper? I, I just find that so wonderful, just in terms of you know, thinking about uh, literature uh, or you know, the institutions of literature that hold the power in describing it as doing, undergoing some kind of process of reflection and redefinition, which is great. Um, and then the second thing I just wanted to do really quickly, I'm not sure if I, I'm gonna, I, I know how to articulate it as a question, but I just wanted to thank uh, Professor Skitters uh, so much for, for talking about love. Um, it's something so difficult to, I mean, we talk about translation issues, like bringing that into the academy, to most spaces in the modern world, but the academy especially, specifically is incredibly challenging. This is, um, I don't know, maybe, it, too much of my own reflection and not to project on any of my colleagues and professors here, but it, it's not a profession that is very uh, open to vulnerability, <laughs> to admitting it, um, but that's so powerful. And I, and I just kind of, I, I also wanted to thank uh, the sir over here for his comment. And it just made me think if maybe you could share some more thoughts on the relationship between love and language. Um, and I want to thank you again, just because it's, I'm so humbled by your love, honestly. It's something that I am consistently astounded by, floored by. Some of the most historically oppressed people always talking about love. I was at a, a conference very luckily yesterday. Uh, uh, Sir Hilary Beckles was, uh, who was actually part of the, the reparations project um, for the Caribbean, which I actually I can, would love to discuss some more because I feel like there's some really wonderful connections that can be made with this project. But he said, you know, the history that we're taught, Western historiography is a history of hate. It's a history of hate. We need to make a history of love. And I just, that coming from, you know, from you, from him, it's just, it's astounding. So thank you so much. This one, yeah. just a uh, just a question for one of the the panelists here, uh, Professor Skidders. Oh, <laughs> oh, you should be. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, and it's uh, really also about parents' motivation. Uh, do you have uh, uh, the autonomy to decide teaching plans, curricula yourselves, uh, or have you taken? that autonomy. And if you have taken the autonomy, how do you ensure that uh, your students can pass on into uh, uh, the, the, the state, uh, to the high schools and, 
and, and the colleges, uh, will they be accepted as students uh, to move forward in the educational system? Because this is kind of um, a crucial question if you want uh, to organize, uh, if indigenous peoples want to organize their own educational system. Thank you very much. It's a really good question. <laughs> um, we do, we, we are autonomous. We are not under New York State. And where our school and our reservation is located, we are on the border of, of the United States and Ontario and Quebec. So our reservation is on all three districts. Um, but our school in particular, um, we are autonomous we're independent we do we're considered a private school but like if you've seen our school it's a really poor private school <laughs> not a fancy private school um, because we don't accept money from the federal government because we don't want their strings attached to what we do we want to be able to have the choice to teach our students what we want to teach with that said it's hard because we can't just ask the state or whoever for a new building so we have to find other ways to do it and um so the way, so what we've done is we do have a uh, friends of the Aquasustin Freedom School 501c3, and what they do is they apply for grants and things, but n not always through the federal government. Usually through other um, foundations and agencies that support, you know, um, the language and culture revitalization. So they're kind of a separate entity, but they, they you know, financially support us. Um, and then as far as our students, we, like, we've, we've talked about having high school go right up to, like, a grade level 12. We call it levels because students move up. Um, like, if a student's language proficiency isn't that great, they will stay in that level an extra year to, keep, to improve their language proficiency. Or things are talked about with the parents at home, like maybe, you know, maybe they're coming to school and they're learning, but they're not hearing anything at home, and so they're not really progressing. So then, you know, the family is talked to, and things are done to help push them forward to keep them their language to keep improving and adding on. Um, we, our our issue is that because we're under the Haudenosaunee Confederacy the Mohawk Nation, we don't really want to, we haven't figured out a way to give them like a high school diploma um, because we don't under, we don't think that asking New York State or Canada to say that our students are proficient enough to graduate from the Freedom School is kind of backwards. Like how do they know they're proficient? We know they're proficient. And so what we do is we have our leadership from the Mohawk Nation, the traditional leadership the chiefs, the clan mothers, at the end of every year, they come to the school and they're part of our releasing day and they speak to the students and they encourage them to continue learning their language even outside of the school, even if they leave and go to high school. Um, so we've had students go up to grade level, like grade eight, go into grade nine or 10 or 11. And, and um, we've had some students who've struggled because there isn't any English um, taught. We don't teach them English. We, don't, we teach them everything's in the language, science, math, reading, writing, it's all in the language. So like, like I can tell you about my daughter, for instance, she went up to level eight and then she went to high school. But around when she was in like grade five, she expressed an interest in wanting to read. So I said, okay, so let's learn to read. So she taught herself how to read and I helped her, but she mostly taught herself. So by the time she got to high school, she had read I don't know how many books, but she, so when she was in grade nine, she struggled a little bit with like grammar, you know, like writing essays and taking tests because we have a lot of our tests are like oral or they're um, hands on or they're not really tests like standardized tests. So she did struggle a little bit in the beginning, just getting used to the culture of a high school. Like she went from a, a school of you know, say 60 kids to a school of 2,000. So it was a little bit of a culture shock for her. Um, and she struggled a little bit, but for the most part, she was like on honor roll by the second semester. So it really didn't have that much of an effect on her. Um, 
And as far as her language, that's the hard part is our kids, we spend all these years, 10 years teaching them our language and they go to high school and in four years it's gone, sometimes in a year because it's so, they're so assimilated so fast. Um, and a lot of our students have done pretty well. They go to high school and some struggle in different areas, um, but so do kids in public school. You know, kids can be in a public school their whole lives and they still don't know how to read or maybe can't have a hard time with math or have a hard time with other issues. And so what I tell parents when they sign up their students in pre-K is, you know, you are always welcome to teach your children at home. If they're ready to learn English, teach them at home. Just like if they were in a public school, you would teach them their tradition and their language and their culture at home. They would get that from their home. So it's the same, just in reverse. And parents will, like when their kids are in grade one, two, three, and they start to express an interest, they'll find them a tutor. Or they'll help them to learn those things that we aren't, the English that we're not going to teach at the school. Does that answer your question? <laughs> And I'll just answer her question about poetry real quick, about the kids singing, because I thought it was a good question. Um, our, song dance, our songs and dances that we have, we, um, the ceremony ones, you know, are, I don't know, the ceremony ones, I guess, could be considered poetry, but they're not usually written down. They're learned orally, and they're only learned amongst Haudenosaunee people. So it wouldn't be something that, you know, we would share outside of our people our nation um but there are there are also social dances and songs that are shared that can be shared anytime with anyone in those songs um twice a year they have these um gatherings called the sing where singing groups actually make up new songs or bring old songs back and um a lot of the groups make up new songs and they're um some of them are pretty they're pretty creative. They're using a lot of the language. Um, and so they're kind of like modern. But they're so, yeah, I would consider those poetry. There's some of them that are really, really good ones that are in my head right now playing. No, <laughs> But, um, yeah, I think there is a little bit. I don't think we call it poetry, but I know what you're saying is, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, could you translate? Because I, I want to speak Spanish. Uh, a mí me gustaría responder una pregunta muy interesante que se hizo al principio, ¿verdad? Uh, y que decía, ¿por qué yo creo que los mexicanos tienen como un bloqueo mental para aprender el inglés? So, yo creo que no hay evidencia científica para afirmar tal cuestión. Y sostener ese argumento en un evento como este traería muchas implicaciones uh, que yo creo que no son buenas. ¿no? Uh, entonces voy a hablar desde el punto de vista de la lingüística. Y lo que nosotros hemos, o que sabemos a partir de nuestras investigaciones sobre bilingüismo en México y sobre multilingüismo en otros países, es que en realidad las personas tienen diferentes niveles de proficiencia en las lenguas. ¿verdad? En mi caso, por ejemplo, uh, puedo leer los textos en inglés perfectamente, sin necesidad de, de un diccionario o, o de Google Translate, por ejemplo, y puedo entender lo que se dice en los textos muy bien. Uh, puedo escribir en inglés y en español simultáneamente, ¿verdad? y puedo entender cuando hablan las personas, pero... Cuando hablo, tengo que hacerlo más pausadamente. Es decir, cuando yo hablo inglés, necesariamente tengo que hablar con menos rapidez que cuando hablo español. ¿verdad? Ah, y eso se debe, hasta donde nosotros hemos investigado, a qué tanto estamos expuestos a la lengua. ¿verdad? Ah, mi arribo a Estados Unidos no tiene mucho, hace un año y medio, menos, un poco. Y entonces... Eh, He aprendido a comunicarme en inglés, pero lo tengo que hacer más lento. Como lingüista y como investigador en educación, me empecé a preguntar por qué era así. Entonces, en mis clases de náhuatl, cuando doy clases de náhuatl aquí en Columbia University, utilizo dos lenguas 
para hacer esa enseñanza. En México, si yo enseñara eh, náhuatl en México, utilizaría yo español y náhuatl. ¿va? Pero cuando llegué aquí dije, bueno, no voy a usar español para nada o voy a usar español solamente para a explicar cosas fundamentales, pero los textos, las instrucciones van a ir en inglés y van a ir en náhuatl. Y curiosamente me empecé a dar cuenta que los estudiantes me comprendían más que cuando yo usaba el español, por ejemplo, para hacer ese, uh, dar las clases en esta lengua. Eso nos muestra algo interesante, que finalmente los hablantes aprenden a una lengua nueva cuando tomamos su lengua base un poco, para irlos introduciendo a la lengua nueva. Y bueno, claro, algo interesante que yo he visto es que los hablantes entienden los textos escritos, escriben a, hasta cierto punto en la lengua, pero también cuando hablan lo hacen muy lentamente, sobre todo porque si ustedes se dieron cuenta al principio, el náhuatl es una lengua altamente aglutinante, es decir, hace unas palabras muy grandes ¿verdad? y a veces cuesta mucho trabajo pronunciar esas palabras. En el caso del maya, por ejemplo, es una lengua que glotaliza mucho, que tiende a la glotalización. En el caso del zapoteco, en algunas variantes es tonal. Y entonces, realmente no podemos decir que hay como un bloqueo. En realidad, lo que podríamos decir es que van desarrollándose las habilidades progresivamente hasta que llegan los hablantes a dominar la lengua. Yo tengo muchos estudiantes que son mexicanos, bueno, de ascendencia mexicana y que están radicando en Estados Unidos y su español es diferente, es distinto. El español que ellos hablan, algunas veces no entienden lo que yo digo porque utilizo términos que se utilizan solo en México, pero yo creo que no tienen ningún bloqueo para el español como tal, sino simplemente que han aprendido otras cosas e incluso han creado un nuevo español, ¿verdad?, uh, en algunas investigaciones que hemos hecho sobre el español de la frontera de México, nosotros tenemos que los uh, hijos de mexicanos han creado nuevos términos, entonces tenemos términos como guachar, este, parquear, la troca ¿no? y otras expresiones más complejas que se han creado en esa lengua. Yo creo que hablamos, cuando hablamos de multilingüismo o bilingüismo, Necesitamos un poco de más tiempo para realmente comprender y luego explicar ese fenómeno. Uh, y también comprendo que cuando hablamos de multilingüismo, uh, los ánimos como que eh, suben, como que uh, la discusión se vuelve muy compleja, precisamente porque hablar una lengua no es solamente usar un código, hay muchas implicaciones emocionales, políticas, sociales, etcétera, etcétera. Uh, yo creo que es necesario hacer eventos que nos permitan como profundizar en esta situación uh, de multilingüismo que vivimos sobre todo aquí en Estados Unidos, pero que no es eh, particularmente de esta ciudad, sino que es de todas las grandes ciudades como tal. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thanks. Uh, first to the poetry question. Uh, yes, uh, I would consider uh, the wording of our traditional songs, uh, songs uh, the Sami yoiks, uh, for poetry. And in fact, we have, uh, that is probably the literature genre, uh, Sami poetry, that is uh, most developed. Uh, and I think it's because it origins from that uh, singing tradition. And so it's a treasure, for sure. We are not great dancers, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, a comment on, on that mental block. Uh, I, I would say that, that I have experienced the opposite, a mental block for, for uh, learning Sami language. And this is, uh, uh, of course, because of stigmatization, of uh, harsh assimilation pol policy. Uh, but also because of lack of exposure to Sami language, makes it more difficult to learn. Uh, and maybe also uh, because of some kind of shame for not 
being able to speak your own language. It's 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 uh, uh, a position of uh, of guilt and shame. And I uh, I didn't learn uh, Sami language in my own home. Uh, I learned Norwegian. So so that kind of mental block I I have experienced it my, myself. Uh, and I would also li like to comment on um, on uh, the gentleman from uh, from the language ca caucus. Uh, yes, of course, and this is an essential problem that we are talking now about bilinguality and uh, multilinguality, and then we tend to forget that some language forget that some languages start on another point. We are not. There is not not equality when it comes to languages. So, so uh, before we talk about bilinguality, we have, to, we have to ensure that the indigenous language, which is often also a an, an minority language, uh, is at the same starting point. Uh, it needs to be strengthened first. Thank you. Um, okay. Is that, is that okay? Yeah? Okay. Well, I'll try to be brief uh, because I have several uh, answers. So first, thank you, Miriam, for your comments. It is a pleasure to see that there are projects in South America that are convergent with what's going on in Mexico and that are actually in touch with the same authors that we're working with. Um, then I would like to address the question about the challenges in the United States. Uh, regarding civil rights and indigenous languages and um, the, the preservation of Spanish. Um, this, well, as a project, we are based in Mexico and it is a, a multi-university project, basically. So we are, it is universities working uh, together to promote this. And this is mainly um, an initiative uh, that has, that came from, that arose from uh, scholars and professors themselves because they saw the need and because they are passionate about this. Um, what we are trying to do, well, the project is very recent. It started last year, as I said. Uh, but uh, what we are open to is um, receiving, we're open to receiving um, works that are produced in Mexican indigenous languages in the United States. So if you know anybody who, who does it or if anybody knows someone here, uh, we are really trying to encourage that. So that, I, I guess that would be our um, contribution to, to that. Um, then uh, regarding uh, the, the, the government's problem here in education, um, what we are doing is that we are lucky to have the participation uh, of somebody that belongs, well, not, not somebody that belongs, the current director of the National Institute of Indigenous Languages with us. So that person can actually act as a link between what universities are doing and what the government is doing. And um, I know that INALI is, encourages it's, it encourages initiatives from everybody and it receives periodically. I think it opens applications. Um, I don't remember, I'm not sure. But uh, I have seen that it has received in the past applications and projects to encourage and revitalize indigenous languages. So um, that would be the bridge, right? The, the, the missing um, part that could put together what, the, what universities are doing. Uh, now, as for the, the dance, song, rituals question that um, Tanya uh, posed. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much because I've heard wonderful things about what's being done in New Zealand and listening to you was amazing. Uh, but then, so, um, songs, as far as I know, are, of course, uh, a form of poetry when it comes... Um, in the linguistic strict 
uh, terminology when they are written, right? Also when they're orally, orally said, but as linguistic elements. As for dance, I am, uh, we are not doing anything related to dance. We know that we're encouraging music, but um, dance as a form of poetry and rituals as a form of poetry is something that I would take as a recommendation for the people that are uh, involved in the project and let's see what happens. <laughs> and uh, finally, for uh, the, the Pulitzer Prize question, <laughs> Uh, a musician winning the Pulitzer uh, Prize. Well, there are many disciplines, and literature is is is, is one um, is something. Music is something else. They're all intertwined. Uh, but I think that what ma matters here is that if if music is written linguistically, written scripts or <laughs> whatever we can call call it, it is poetry, and in that sense. Uh, it is related to literature. Uh, otherwise, I would say that mathematics is also a language and you know, the Pulitzer Prize is not going to mathematician. Um, as, um, uh, as for somebody winning the uh, Pulitzer Prize for writing in an indigenous languages, well, I look forward to see that moment and <laughs> I guess we all look forward for that. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. I think that's a good point to close our panel and move on to the closing plenary session.